Welcome to the first episode of the Weekly Juice Podcast. My name is Ryan Dabalakwa, and I'm joined alongside here with my co-host, Corey Jacobson. Today, in the first episode, we're going to discuss the FIRE movement and the early stages of setting oneself up to be financially free. We'll start with goal setting and move on to different steps you can take along the way to set yourself up in the long run of being financially free. So without further ado, let's dive in. Everything good over there on your on your uh, in your household? I know you're stuck inside with the whole coronavirus thing. Quarantining, different different world we live in today, man. But um, I went yeah. on a sick walk today, so that was fun. That's sick. Yeah, that's sick. that was awesome. So I will say, there there's been like a couple big things that I want to do. Obviously, I want to start reading a lot more and just yeah. kind of studying while while I can. I set a couple like the gyms are all closed, right? So yeah. I set up a couple goals for myself. Uh, running wise, it's been ripping runs a lot. Um, so 10 miles, 10 miles on a 745 pace. You kidding me? So, it. so basically my two goals were one, I needed to break a six minute mile for just like one mile. And then the other one was broad street run got pushed back. It's a 10 mile race. And yeah, so I was like, yeah. I'm doing 10 miles in one rip at some point. So I just, last week I just sat, I'm like, dude, I'm just doing it. Did it both. <laughs> I saw it on your Instagram. felt so good. It's just, the, it's something else to challenge yourself. Whereas like at, when you're when you're fixed to the nine to five, you, you can work out at a certain point. Right. Yeah. So yeah. to be able to work and make your own schedule is awesome right yeah. now. That um, is a good, that is one of the good things about this is I think people are starting to get into routines of working from home and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, everything's good on my end. I think we can get into this here. We're really excited for this, this episode. I think um, in our intro episode, we didn't, we were kind of broad, but I think right now we really want to like dive a little bit deeper into what is this whole financial independence retire early thing. It's actually an acronym, FIRE, F-I-R-E. And it's kind of a, it actually stands for financial independence retire early. And the, the whole basis behind it, we didn't start it. We're not, we, we just follow along with it. But it, it, it basically is saying that like retirement isn't an age, like it's a financial number. It's not this mythical 65 year old thing that exists. It's, it, it's a myth. It's totally a myth. Like, and you know, when keeping up with the Joneses sets in, everyone's just like, well, I guess that's what I should do. And you and I and other people that we're talking to are starting to be like, hold on, man, this is not for me. I don't want to do that. So, um, you know, it's realistic to retire at 40. I know people who are retired at 40. I know people who are retired at 45. Um, I know people, you know, even, even younger, even younger. I mean, that's really, really hard to do. There's a lot of sacrifices to be made, but like, it's all about what's important to you. So I think that's a good place to dive in. Uh, there's a lot of questions to be answered about the actual fire movement, but I can give you, you know, some examples about, you know, how to get started and, and what's, what's necessary. Um, so I guess like, painting a picture of what true freedom looks like. I think what a lot of people get involved in, in, you know, their twenties is they paint this picture about how they have to get married by a certain age and they have to have kids by a certain age and they have to buy a house with a white picket fence at a certain age. And they have to work for 40 or 50 years and retire at a certain age. And by the way, if you want to do all those things, that's great. I'm just saying there's another, there's another avenue, right? There's another way to do it. And um, you know, avoiding this so-called lifestyle creep where you see all your friends around you buying the huge home and buying the sweet car when they're 29 or 28 or, or there's ways to cut back and say, what is it really important for me to spend my money on? For me, it's travel. That's one of the things I mean. And by the way, I like cars too. It's just, I'm going to have my luxuries, uh, be paid for by my passive income, not my W-2 income. So that's kind of one thing. So bring it, bring it way back to lifestyle creep. What is that? Um, okay. A lot of people have different definitions of what lifestyle creep really is, but I think what ends up happening is, and I'll give you the best example that I can think of is when two people are in their mid thirties and they have a kid and they're ready to buy their first home together. Okay. And you go out and you look at what your friends are doing and you know, your friends move to the suburbs and they bought this, $500,000, $600,000 home because when they went to their agent, they said, you know what? You guys make X amount of money. 
together, you and your, your husband and your wife, and you can afford this much. So you say, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I guess I'm just supposed to buy a home that takes up 30 or 40% of my income. That's not always what you have to do. Um, I think that if instead of buying a $600,000 home, you bought a $350,000 home, you free up a lot of your life to, to spend money on what's important to you. Is it really important to, to you? And it may be to have the nicest finishes and the newest home and show off to people that at the end of the day, you don't really care about. That's kind of an idea of what lifestyle creep is. It's also called keeping up with the Joneses where you see all your friends as you grow older, like, oh, I have to buy this new thing and I have to get this new thing. And what ends it ends up doing, it ends up making you a slave to your job because you have to go to your job and show up every single day to pay for things that you don't really need. We, again, we didn't make this up. It's just reiterating this to people. What is lifestyle creep, right? I think yeah, that's Well, if you think about it too, say you get a promotion at work and your income goes up. People their lifestyle, they start readjusting their lifestyle to that, that income. Whereas if they That's just good, live That's so in good. their current means, like say, say when you first started your jobs, you had a $40,000 salary, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you move up to an $80,000 salary. If you can continue to live off of live the same way you did on that 40,000 with the 80,000, yeah. you're doubling what you can save essentially. Um, so, I mean, obviously numbers might be changed a little bit, but, um, it, the, the lifestyle creep is when when that the pinnacles both of them meet at the at the center and you're just and then one overtakes the other at the end of the day like you start making you hear millionaires all, there's a bunch of millionaires out there that um they're poor at the end of the day they're just they i don't know how to like totally voice this book basically they're spending more or spending that million dollars rather than putting away four hundred thousand of it well, it's, here's an example. Let's say I could, I think that somebody who makes $50,000 a year, which in today's times is looked at as average, right? Um, if you make $50,000 a year, I would say that there are people that are much happier making $50,000 a year than making a million dollars a year because they spend their time, they spend their money on things that they really want. What are their non-negotiables? For example, you can make $50,000 a year and spend $25,000 a year and retire when you're 40 because your expenses are low, as opposed to making a million dollars a year and spending 996,000 of it and being a literal slave to your job and being upset and emotional. And you know what that leads to? That leads to bad relationships and, and, and sloppy lifestyle and maybe not taking care of your health, right? So those are all things that are important. I think that you, that's a really good point, Ryan. Like, it, you can be you can be broke making a million dollars a year, and you can be rich making fifty thousand dollars a year. That's pretty cool. Like if you really break it down, to, it's all numbers. It's all numbers game. So it's huge. For me, um, one of the books I read it was called Set for Life by Scott Trench, Dude. and it really? literally broke down the steps on how to break away from the income creep mm -hmm. and set yourself up for the long term. Right? It, it talked about the steps along the way, but also things to get rid of in your life or how little tweaks that you can make to make your life easier and make your money build and compound over time. Yeah. Um, I believe you read the same book. Um, and it, I kind of wanted to dive into your Mercedes story. Um, <laughs> if you yeah. don't mind. It, it, it actually is a story that hits home for me, man, because it, it, uh, it, you know, it changed my life. It really did. I was 22 years old. And I got a sales job in medical insurance. And I can tell you one thing about medical insurance is that I'm never going to do that again. Uh, it sucked. I hated it. But I was like, I'm a, I was always a numbers guy. So I, was, I, I went out and I purchased a used Mercedes. It wasn't a new one, but it was a used Mercedes. And uh, I factored all my numbers in and, and, and did all my homework, I thought. And then I was realizing that this Mercedes was not costing me the $350 a month that I was spending on my, um, my payment for it. It was $350 a month. It was $150 for insurance. I was traveling. I was in sales. It was another $350 for gas. It ended up being almost $1,000 a month. And I thought to myself, does this really like make me happier? Uh, I didn't know. I, I love the car. I, I'm going to buy another Mercedes one day for sure but I'm going to have my passive income pay for it. So a long story short, I bought it when I was 22. I ended up selling it when I was 26, I believe. And um, what it did for me is it allowed me to buy a hybrid. Uh, so I, I saved from that $350 a month on gas. I now spend a hundred. Um, my payment went down by about $150 a month. My insurance went down. And I said to myself, I can still have a nice used car 
by the way, it's a Lexus, which it's, it's nice. I still like it. And, uh, it's a hybrid, but I, cause I like cars. It's one of the things that I, I are sort of my, uh, non-negotiables that I always, I want to have a nice car, but it's an older model. It still runs great. And I was able to essentially save myself five to $600 of cash flow a month in my pocket because I knew what was more important driving this really nice car or saving money to invest to help money make my money work for me uh, later in life. So. so stop right there. We're going to be using that term a lot throughout the podcast. I think cash flow. Yeah. Can you dive in, explain what that is early on so that way people feel comfortable moving forward? Yeah. So um, there's a lot of ways you can look at cash flow. I think one of the ways you can look at it is personal cash flow, and that's pretty simple. Um, you can look at cash flow monthly. Essentially, it's taking the amount of income that you make on a, a monthly basis, and then you subtract your, you know, living expenses from that to get your cash flow. Obviously, in your living expenses, we're talking about housing, we're talking about your car, we're talking about things like insurance, we're talking about food, um, you know, all the things on a monthly basis that you spend money on. You take your income and you subtract those expenses, and then you have your cash flow. If we want to talk about cash flow, or a lot of people talk about it from real estate perspective, it's um, I can give you just a, a roundabout example. Um, you know, hypothetically, let's just say that you have a uh, a mortgage on a rental property, and within that mortgage, you're paying for uh, the mortgage itself. You're paying for taxes. You're paying for insurance. Uh, you know, within that mortgage, let's say that mortgage, taxes, and insurance adds up to be about a thousand dollars. Okay, and let's say you're getting rent from um, from your tenants. Uh, at two thousand dollars, that's the the market value for the rent. Um, what you would do is a lot of people think that okay, you must be two thousand minus a thousand. That means you're making a thousand dollars a month in cash flow, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, you also have to account for things like capital expenditures, which is when major operational things in your house break. So you know if a roof goes, if you need a new hot water heater, um, if you need a new air conditioning system, those are capital expenditures. So essentially you just take a portion of that rent. I like to use the number 5%. So 5% of $2,000 is $100. Um, so there's $100 for capital expenditures. Also $100 for maintenance. Maintenance is just like, you know, certain things break in the house, like a, a leak uh, in a faucet, you know, or um, certain things you have to put, um, let's see new light bulbs in. you have to buy certain things there. And then, um, also uh, that's the, I like to use the number 5% on that too. And then, so that's another hundred dollars a month. And then, um, vacancy, which is the time when you're in between tenants and you need to fill the property. So a good number of people use there is 5% as well. So if your mortgage insurance and taxes is a thousand dollars a month and your, um, vacancy is a hundred dollars a month. Your capital expenditures is a hundred dollars a month. And then your maintenance is a hundred dollars a month. It's already built in. So $300 a month plus a thousand dollars a month comes to $1,300 a month in expenses for you. The rent is coming in at $2,000 a month. Um, and that would, uh, equal about $700 a month in cash flow in your pocket. All the, you know, all the other things that you would have to pay for in your house is already covered. So as long as you run your numbers right, that that's kind of how you get to that seven hundred dollars in cash flow. And like I said before, I I want my cash flow um, to pay for my luxuries in my life. So I hope I hope to build up enough cash flow that one day I can buy the things that I don't necessarily need right now, but I do really want. Um, but that passive income or that cash flow doesn't take a lot of time for you to um, like. You're not spending a lot of time working on that throughout the week like you would at a forty hour a week W2, you're spending maybe five to 10 hours a week, depending upon how you manage it, or you could hire a property manager and we could talk about that too. And I think and one other important thing you said was you want your passive income and your cash flow to be able to pay for your luxuries, right? So you talk about how one day you will have that Mercedes again, but right now you're saving up all the funds to pump into an asset rather than a liability. Correct. And yeah. That asset is going to generate more cash flow. So you can pull it out for your car and it's going to roll into your business one day. Yeah. Yeah. So another thing that we can talk about here is um, like, what is important to you? Because in the books at for life, Scott Trench talks a lot about like, look, you don't have to cut out everything like in order to save money. There's things that I really, um, that I say, like, I'm not going to cut back on, uh, but your biggest expenses are your housing and your car, right? I mean, those are your two biggest expenses. We talked about house. Hacking, What's the right? third? What's the third? Food. 
Who's the third, right? Yeah. There's, we're, there's, we can do a whole episode on that. That's pretty cool stuff. But can you explain to people, we talked about house, house hacking in the, um, in the intro episode, but I'd like you to give people kind of a roundabout way. What is house hacking and how can that help people who are in their young twenties um, or even people who are older um, that want to try this save on their biggest expense, which is their housing. Sure. Um, well, it's making the conscious decision to purchase a home or a property mm -hmm. rather than rent. And yeah, what you do yeah. is you have someone, whether, you know, a lot of people, when they first start out, someone in their network, friends, family members, um, coworkers move in with them. So essentially it would be buying for, to give an example, similar to what you did buy a duplex and you have four, three rooms in the house you take one of the rooms and then you have someone else in your network, take the other two rooms. So essentially you have your mortgage, say it's X amount, 1500 bucks. Mm -hmm. You have, you charge 750 ahead for um, the rent and then you pay the rest. So essentially you're getting a discount on your own, on your own monthly rent payment. Um, or like in the example you just said, I think if you were saying there's three bedrooms, if each of them, each of the bedrooms in theory is seven fifty a month to, to live there, then you have your mortgage paid by having two renters, right? It's pretty much paid up. Yeah. yeah. It is paid up. Except for um, maybe, you know, the expenses of utilities that you might split. But I mean, imagine in your twenties paying zero dollars to live and living with friends too. You can do it where you have, you know, get roommates off Craigslist or whatever, but like not everyone wants to go down this path. So the people that do, I think, it's a, it's, I mean, it's an amazing way to set yourself up to create that cash flow monthly, right? I think a lot of people also think that they have to do this in a city and it has to be a duplex, like around, uh, around a large city rather than being able to do it in the suburbs. And you can, you can do this with a, a single family home. It's, it's just the amount of room that are in it. That's um, what I have. I have a single family home. Like it's not, it's, it's a simple, simple process. I mean, um, and you can have just as much fun as if you're renting. I'm living with like two of my best friends. It's great. And they pay rent and they're paying, they're helping their friend out as opposed to paying a random person that they don't know. And um, they're paying probably what they would pay elsewhere, if not less. So we talked about that um, a little bit in the last episode. But yeah, do you have anything else to add on cash flow? Um, or that not really cash flow, but this be being that we're talking about the the beginning stages right or inception phase of starting to save money and like moving into moving forward in your financial journey having a nest egg and i'll say nest egg a ton of times it's just essentially having a bulk of cash as your it's a, almost like a safety net right but what they say is you should have a to know you're on the right track to have six months worth of expenses saved yeah if you have a year's worth of expenses saved that literally means you can be out of a job for an entire year, having your mortgage, your food, car, everything paid, all your expenses. So what I would suggest people do is create a budget starting in simplest form as Excel. There's a ton of them you can find on the internet, but figure out what your expenses are monthly and then multiply that by 12. So you figure it out. Say so a basic one is say your expenses are 50 grand a year, right? Between say you have a girlfriend, your wife, or it's just you or by yourself, significant other, however it is that combine them and whatever those the uh, the output is say it's 50 grand a year you need fifty thousand dollars to be safe for a whole year yep. um and then the longer you do that set it out then you know you're good moving forward but i think before you even talk about adding different streams of revenue and bringing having your money work for yourself it's it's starting so basic it's like you need to learn to save your money yep um i was reading uh it's called richest man in babylon and yeah just brings back all the most basic um, savings rules of and, and money. And it talks about the first step is save 10% of everything that you bring in and just put it aside. And you, and you start to realize you don't even think about it. So yeah. I have this one random account that I decided I'm just going to transfer 200 bucks every check into that account. Mm -hmm. And I, you almost forget about it yeah. and wake up. That's, that's 400 bucks a month or more, you know, just for, every other whatever bi-weekly right so yeah. 400 bucks a month you forget about it. a couple months you open up you're like oh i don't over a thousand bucks in here it's yeah. great and yeah. just to use on little things like so okay then like go to dinner you, like it. I'm in. If you don't even think about it yeah yeah so um and and i didn't believe that to be true honestly i was like i'm definitely going to notice this being out of my check but you just you start living off once again living off the means that you did before and you kind of like oh yeah i don't know i just didn't even realize this wasn't here yeah um, 
It's so it all starts with spending, right? And that's the biggest thing. Also, um, products like I use Mint. Mint is great. So you have you enter all your credit card information. By the way, it's it's made by Intuit. It's completely safe. You enter all your credit card information, um, all your accounts in there, and it tracks your monthly spending for you. So you know. I think that's one of the biggest problems in our society is that people don't even know how much they spend. They put ten thousand dollars on a credit card and don't even realize that five hundred dollars they're getting charged five hundred dollars a month in interest. It's just coming out of their account. Once you get control of that, you 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 just become a more dynamic person. You become you become more in control of not only your spending but like your life in general. I mean imagine being able to go to your employer uh in you know if you really really hate your job. Again, this is about happiness and saying, dude, like fuck you, I'm done. Like I got a year's, you know, maybe you're not saying this, but I got a year's worth of savings it, saved up. I don't have to do a job that I don't like. Again, this is simple. It comes down to happiness. Like you can't create happiness for yourself if you're struggling every week and you have to take the next job that's available, even if it might not be your passion. Time creeps up on you and you'll, you'll realize five years went by, four years went by, and you're still living the same lifestyle that you have. And then you, you're not saving enough money. You're going out on the weekend, spend your money on, on food and drinks and just things that they're, they just, they're waste, right? Like, you know, there's nothing tangible. Like they go yeah. away you need them to live. But, um, a lot of people, at least our age are from in the 20, in their twenties, they're living for the weekends, man. And they're not thinking about, okay, I'm going to wake up in my thirties, wake up in my forties. and I'm not going to have cash. Like other people, Hey, how come this guy can do this and do this? And they're going on these vacations and do that. They made a conscious, conscious effort years back that they were going to put money away. Yeah. And I see a bunch of my friends, like, it just happens. You, you see people that they just don't have it. They can't get it together. And it's, you don't want to preach at the end of the day, right? It's just, it's taking those little steps and, and making the effort yourself to, to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this now. Rather yeah. Than yeah. And, and again, it's not our, it's not in our best interest and we don't want to preach. I think that again, this is, this comes down to one thing. It comes down to happiness. Like if you're happy, doing what you're doing, then continue to do it. But this is the, I just want other people to know that there is another way. There's another route. You should see the, and we'll, we'll put up some statistics for you, for you guys at some point, maybe not this episode, but the, you should see the statistics about America and how much people save, let alone investing. The average person saves probably 3% of their income in the United States. So um, the exponential growth that, that gives you, if you go to 6% to 12% to 24 to, um, to uh, 48%, like people in this world save 75% of their income and they're, they're, they live a free life. I, I think that's personally a little crazy. That's like, I, I wouldn't be happy living the lifestyle of spending like, you know, 10 people live off $10,000 a year. Like it's crazy, but talk to them. And I bet that they're probably pretty happy doing what they're doing. So, I mean, there's always levels to this, but if you can double the amount that you save per year, your life will change, change drastically. And I bet all the things that you cut out, I bet your happiness level doesn't go down I, at all. I really it's, don't think it will. It's freeing up your time, right? I, I feel like a lot of people, they're like, well, I, I don't mind doing this. I, I like going to work and things like a lot of people do. We all, I like going to work. It's yeah. more that they, it's having, it's saving the money for the long term. to a lot of people are going to have kids one day, right? A lot of people do want to buy a house but travel, exploring, seeing the world, yeah. seeing what's out there and just being able to pick up and go and, and having the cash to do it and not think about it. That's what's motivating. That's why you do it. Like it's good. It's a struggle, right? Like, yeah, it's hard, man. Especially right now, the economy's dipping. It's hard. It's hard, but, um, there, like we're saying, there's ways to put yourself small in small steps. It's just, it's really small in the beginning. And then once you start seeing your cash build upon itself, and you're like, wow, I can actually do this. And then you start looking in the different avenues of, okay, do I go stocks? Do I go real estate? Do I go e-commerce? There's so many different things where you can invest and work in it. It's in 2020. I mean, right now the, the world's a little funky, but you see people making a lot of dough in unconventional ways, which is very exciting. Yeah. And it's because they, a lot of people have the ability to take that risk, right? I think that's what scares people the most is they don't have, people think they don't have the ability to take the risk because if that next paycheck doesn't show up, they're shit out of luck. Right. So th again, all comes back to saving. I mean, I heard one thing. It sounds, like, it sounds like rudimentary almost like, Oh, save your money. But like, uh, it's so powerful, dude. Like it's, it's it really, and you make the, 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 the secret is make it automatic. So you don't think about it. Yeah. You talk true. about, there's so many things I can go into about 
making things automatic where it's, it's your bill pay automatic, mm -hmm. your mortgage automatic, but make sure in, in your mortgage, you're always paying a little bit extra to have an extra year paid on. So what we did, we, we just divided our mortgage payment by 12 and took that little sliver of 12 and added it to every month. So that way of one extra month, month's worth of the mortgage paid up. Cool. Um, yeah. And over time that saves a certain amount of money, but you know, if you can do more, you do more. Um, but back to um, savings, it's, it's pay term here, pay yourself first. A lot of people go right to paying their bills, right? And then all the money gets sucked out of their, sucked out of their, um, their bank account. And they're like, yeah. oh, this sucks. Like I'm just living for the man. Like it doesn't make any sense. If you pay yourself first and see that little sliver of money on your side, like, hey, listen, I did good. Well, it doesn't matter the amount. Just knowing that you did it first, it's something mental. And you can think about it and it boosts the endorphins a little bit. And then you start wanting to, hey, I did a little, like 200 this month. Maybe next month I do 300. Down the line and you boost it all, all the way up to 500 bucks. Yeah. Just, but you have to see it on paper. You can't just guess it. You have to, you have to yep. stand firm and, and have it written down because there's so many things that can get in the way. and, and take that cash away. Dude, you talked about boosting endorphins. I think that's really funny because it's, it's like the same thing with going to the gym and seeing progress. Like if you go to the gym and you go once a week and you don't see progress, you're like, you're probably not going to go back. If you go to the gym four days a week and you see progress, you're like, and a lot of people think this way, like, holy shit, dude, this is working. It's the same thing with like saving and like getting a hold of your income. It's like, it's the momentum. same exact thing. Yeah. It's momentum. And that once that snowball gets rolling down that hill, dude, you're fucking unstoppable. You could be, you could be unstoppable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for, for savings, there's, there's different vehicles and, and avenues you can take to help you save. Um, for one specifically, as opposed to just a normal savings account, go into a money market savings account where you might save one to 3% on that money. Um, they, they, sorry, they pay you one to 3% interest on the money that you have in that account, um, at the end of the month. So as opposed to a regular savings account where it's 0% or 0.2%, um, then you also have your 401k. They say it's a good idea to put, put uh, I believe 10% in that. It's the long-term play right now. They're getting rocked. I understand that the market's down, but keep, keep investing when other people aren't. That's when like the market's down. Now's the time to go in. Um, then you also have real estate. We already talked about that. Um, people buy bonds. There's it just hold and hold them for long. That's like more of an old school style, but there's so many different ways you can save literally putting your change in a piggy bank. And yep. at the end, people used to call it, when I was a kid, they did it as like a Disney fund. Hey, we're going to put all our spare change in here. And once it, this huge bottle fills to the top, we're going to cash it in and, and we're going to go to Disney, which was, and it's awesome. You know, yeah, that's that, cool. It's just something I remember as a kid, my brothers and I, we would do, uh, we'd go to Coinstar. Every, all the, all the spare change we get, it would be, we'd hold it in the laundry room. And then we'd take basically like, my dad went to his pockets, throws change in. Whenever we found change, we would take that huge thing down to Coinstar at the like local stop and shop, and they it would pump out cash. They took a certain certain percentage, but we were, we thought we were rich. We're like, wow, we have like twenty five bucks. Yeah, yeah. Go buy a video game or go to Blockbuster or something crazy. Blockbuster, yeah. rest in peace. Blockbuster, um, yeah. But uh, no, I think like, that's that's a good. I think we can kind of uh, you know on that topic of saving, we can kind of talk about like um, the whole idea of um, W2 income versus passive income and how that relates to saving. Um, sure. I, uh, I like to think that the W2 income that people make is, you know, you, what you have to do is you have to trade your time. We're talking about time being the most valuable thing for money. So you have to show up every day, whether that's at home or whether that's on calls or whether that's at meetings or whether that's physically going to a job site or something like that, you have to show up every day to get a paycheck. So that is W2 income. So, the whole idea about getting into real estate and getting into saving is that using that time where you can kind of hopefully make your W2 income grow, you can cut your expenses the opposite way, right? Or keep them the same, maybe not cut them the opposite way. And then that way that boosts your savings rate to allow you to buy the investments uh, to, to give you the room to buy the luxuries. I always said that I'm going to let my, my investments and my passive income buy my luxuries. I really do want a nice car. I just, I was able to put that on hold. There's a story. Uh, there's like a study. It's like this marshmallow study, right? Have you ever heard about that with the kid? There's, they give, um, they take a group of kids and I, we should probably talk about where this actually came from, but they take a group of kids and they give them like a 
they give 10 kids a one marshmallow, right? And um, they say that if you can wait 10 minutes to eat the marshmallow, uh, I'll give you a second marshmallow. And they talk about just like the perseverance, even in kids, the kids that were able to, I think they studied them again 15 years later and the kids that were able to wait that 10 minutes that, so they don't need that instantaneous satisfaction. They don't need the gratification right up front. Mm -hmm. The kids that were able to wait for it um, were actually much more successful in certain avenues of their life because they didn't need it right now. So that's kind of the thing with saving is like, do I need to go spend this money right now? Or is there another place that I can put it that's going to allow me to be happier and more free down the road? Uh, I, we should talk about. That's cool. I don't, no, want to just I, like start, I don't want to just start like rattling off different <laughs> studies without giving proof to where they came from. That one is real. I probably butchered it, but um, that's it's it. We can put some more information to it or, or get the information out to people through our uh, YouTube account or on Instagram. Oh, one more thing I, I did want to just dive into. Um, it was one of the topics we talked about was food, right? All right. Yeah. Going out to eat is and buying, whether it's fast food or hitting a restaurant, it's 350 times more expensive to do that than cooking at home and going to the grocery store, really? which is insane. Yeah. Is um, insane. Yeah. So I like, just to go off of that, I think a lot of people what they can do and is that they can set times where they're allowing themselves to go out eat to eat in storage. Dude, we went to Soraya, uh, what a month ago. It's an awesome restaurant in Philly. It's um, uh, Lebanese, I believe. But like we, you know, it's a hundred dollars a person. Like you just, it, it's expensive. Like, but the food was amazing, and we really enjoyed ourselves. So if you can, if you can say to yourself, like, I'm gonna allow myself to do that once a month or twice a month, or however much you feel comfortable, if you cut back on it a little bit and do do more cooking at home. I'm a terrible cook. I'm getting better by the day, but like all that stuff, it really does add up. And then you'll be shocked by the end of the month how much money you've saved off that. And all it does is free up your happiness, free up your time. I mean, so if you can turn that, let's just say, for example, you're talking about going out to eat and spend and spending money. Let's just say, you know, the average going out to eat meal is 15 to $20, right? Between lunch, maybe is like 10 to 15 and, and dinners, 15 to 20. If you're not going to like some really fancy spot. I mean, I don't have a calculator here, but like if you do, our producer, Jake may have a calculator. If you yeah. do fit, uh, Let's do like 15 times 30. That's so simple math. What am I an idiot? Um, $450 a month. And that's just like one, by the way, that's just one meal out per day, right? That's $450 a month. I mean, if you can cut that back, you said it's 300 or so. That's just one, like that's just one lunch. Think about if you're going out for, say you're hitting Starbucks for a coffee, say you're getting, say you go to Chick-fil-A for lunch, then dinner, you're like, ah, you know, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a wrap. Even, yeah. even not 15, 20 bucks, or you go out to eat and you have a significant, significant other, you're doubling yeah. up. So it's just, it's insane. The amount, this quarantine has helped me so much. You, yeah. you literally cannot go out. Yeah. So we just, we're just, okay, we're going to the grocery store this day. And we're making it last for X amount of days and saving that. Like you just look at the, the, the bank this month and I'm like, what the heck? We're like, how come we're up? And it doesn't make yeah. sense. So yeah. it's just, it's interesting. Um, and there, it takes what, 21 days to create a habit. So we got plenty of time here. Yeah. Let's create a habit now. So that when we go back and get thrown back in the fire, that we can kind of at least have, have something to stand on and hopefully can get, those good habits stamped in this day up. Um, okay, now we're going to go into our something to share portion of this weekly juice podcast episode. I think we gave you guys a decent amount of information. We're obviously always going to build off of that. But again, in our something to share uh, portion of the episode, what we really want to do is provide you with valuable information to take from our episode tangible things that you can read, read, you know, that you're getting information from other people. Again, we're not gurus. We're just going to provide you with information and tell you elsewhere where you might be able to find more. Um, Ry, do you have one of your something to share um, moments here? Sure. Um, something to share for this week. I'm going to just dive into another book that I just finished. Um, it is called The Richest Man in Babylon. It's, it's an old book and it, it kind of, to me, kind of coincides coincides with um the alchemist and where the alchemist kind of talks about um like one's dream and, and fulfilling your dreams and this one it 
specifically talks about the city of Babylon, how it was the richest, um, richest town in the world for a certain period of time. And then it talked about specifically the richest man in the town. And he wasn't the richest because he was the richest because he learned how to make money where his money work for him and how to utilize all the people around him, his resources work for him. So that way, um, you know, even when he wasn't working, he was gaining additional income. Um, so there's, so it kind of reminds me of like the, the making money when you sleep, dude. That's a pretty good way to make money. We'll talk about that in our next episode. I think we'll go. 100%. I just thought it was so interesting that I save? like why even what's the point of saving? How do you make money work for you? What does investing even like? What does it do for you? That's like it's pretty powerful shit, man. It's uh, you just put it this way. I you know what? At least I do this. I wake up and I shouldn't, but I check my. 401k because I just like to see what the stocks did overnight. But, but you're just in some days you're like, oh, that was hell yeah, like I'm up. And the other days like, ah, like right now you're like, okay, uh, this sucks. Yeah. But it's more motivating to put money elsewhere and like, oh, it's something I can control. And here's, I want to be able to, like I talked about real estate, like something I it's sticky, tangible, like I can maneuver it to, yeah. to work for me. But um, it's good to diversify. So point being, I'd love to wake up and see automatically that I know I'm going to have that every month I'm going to have more money coming in. And when you, it's basically making money when you sleep, when you're, when you're getting uh, mailbox money, long-term rental holds. So, but for, for this purpose, um, rich man, right, you, you gotta get a haircut there, bro. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You totally dogged me there. Um, I'm going to your guy this week. Don't care. Don't, don't care. Um, Amazon prime just pulled up. Maybe it's my desk. Let's go. Oh, we're about, get, we're about to get the real set up. Set the studio up? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, but seven. Okay, so this is like the Ten Commandments for um, it's it's called the Seven Cures for a Lean Purse. So basically, well, talking about the richest man in Babylon, richest right? Man in Babylon. So basically, saying anyone that has like thin pockets, not deep pockets, you they need some cash. Mm -hmm. Here's the cures for that. First cure: start thy purse to fattening. So basically, it means. Hit, this is his way of saying, saying save 10% of everything you earn and put it away. Pay yourself first. Second cure, control the expenditures. So as you and I talked, control your expenses. What are going out? Be careful of how many times you go out to eat. What going out on the weekends and spending too much at the bars. Like there's a lot of things, kids, not kids, but like people our age and even people older, you don't need to go out to dinner every night. You don't. Start cooking, uh, especially right now. Well, how, and then again, housing, car, um, you know, gym memberships. There's all types of, of ways to cut back to, um, to go along with that, right? 100%. Yeah. Third, the third cure, make thy gold multiply. So that's just advising to invest in other avenues rather than just your income from your nine to five and um, make your money work for you. So first cure, guard thy treasures from loss. So this goes into, and which I can talk about in a future episode is, Get a financial planner. Get someone that knows what they're talking about and does it for a living to help you out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't it doesn't have to be and you don't have to go get a commercial advisor that you find online. Go through someone that's recommended to you, family member recommended to you, friend recommended to you, someone that has money, mm -hmm. uses someone that they that has made them money. And so you have essentially a referral. Um, fifth care, make of thy dwelling a profitable investment. So it specifically says buy versus rent and we already went into that a ton of times but that's your that's i'd say for for wanting to take the next step in in your investing career here i would say that's the biggest one and most important one that we like to dive on yeah um, the sixth here ensure a future income so um it talks about a retirement income and we talked about our 401ks right there's you don't have to just go 401k there's roth iras a bunch of retirement savings plans but you need to have one just to diversify and make sure that if, Hey, the real estate doesn't work out, I have this. If my personal savings doesn't work out, I have this. Yeah. You want to, you want to create, it's almost like a, a pie chart, right? And yeah. I'll divide it up into certain slivers. And then the seventh cure, increase the ability to earn. So that's kind of ties into our whole podcast here. And it just means boost your network. And when you're not at work, you need to, learn and you need to be reading and you need to be studying whatever it is you want to do if it's if it's you want to work in real estate or um invest in real estate if you want to invest in stocks if you want bitcoin whatever it is all these different things you need to become a master of them on your time you can't do it on other people's time when you're going to work it's just you 
it doesn't work that way. So um, the, the quote he, he leaves us with here in this book is, the man who seeks to learn more from his craft shall be richly rewarded. The more wisdom we know, the more we may earn. So I just think about it and it goes back to like, even in high school, you see all these kids that they're just super bookworms and you're like, like kind of socially awkward. Some of them, and it, it goes, today you look on Facebook and those kids are driving around in the, in the hot sport car, sports cars. They, already, they have a huge house. Like, you never know. It's just, I'll, what I would recommend is just as early as you can get into reading. It's not, or, or use Audible and yeah. listen, listen to it. Um, so for you and I, we financial independence and real estate, like that just gets our gears turning. And yeah, I don't like reading. I get tired reading sometimes. So I just, I've been using audio books. Yeah. Audio books, podcasts. I think it's a, it's a cheat code. So, yeah. So cool. I mean, this episode, we talked a lot about spending, I think, which will lead directly into the next episode to talk about how to invest, um, how to take that spending and turn it to passive income for yourself. Um, and like, kind of, you know, financial literacy, what it all means, how to put it all together. Um, yeah. Thank cool. You. So um, I just want to reiterate the name. I just went through one of the snippets of the book, but um, there's the teaches about gold and, and how money compounds on top of each other. You guys can dive in, but the book is called the richest man in Babylon. It's a staple. Um, it is written by George Samuel Clayson and you can, you can get that on uh, audible or just paperback. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>